Hi there, this is Daniel, the story of Daniel. Uh, this is a special episode called Family Vacations. Of all the memories I have recovered or kept since the accident, that is how I will refer, refer to it in the future, August 20th, 1987, the day Nixon got to be president one more time. Uh, that's an inside joke if you haven't read all of my stuff. There are a few that came with more information than others, memories that is. Let me explain. After I was admitted to the hospital on August 27, 1987, for those of you just coming to the story, I had a typewriter drop on my head in episode 2. For those of you who don't know, don't know what a typewriter is, I pity you, just keep reading. There were several days of evaluation what I can do, what I can't do. But in all the attention, the process was investigative, and that might really cause my interest to peak. But for whatever reason, I awoke each day with a really good attitude and pushed my limits every hour of every day. I was humbled by all the professionals around me, working hard to help me discover the boundaries of the injuries and my abilities. One of the first losses I discovered I didn't remember people. Oh, I knew who I was. I knew who my father and mother were. And that I had two brothers. But the day after I was adv admitted, a very handsome young guy came to visit. Bearing a get well card. We. Oui. I tried to act like I knew this person. He was a pleasant enough guy in his late teens, early 20s. I was to be 30 that November, handsome and well-dressed. I thought it odd at the time, but he said we were close co-workers. Yet he hugged me when he walked in the door. We talked for some time. He told me how Mr. Yada Yada was in the doghouse at Target because he was the one that put the typewriter on the top of a 25-foot pile of boxes and stuff. That was not on the steel rock racks as it should have been. He told me how everyone was talking about me at work. Told me that blank and blank and blank all send their best. He held my hand, though ironic, I didn't notice for some time, but he grabbed the hand that, well, wasn't working. I, I lost the use feeling in one of my hands. And smiled and sighed a lot. He talked about his father and mother, and they sent their best. What television shows I missed and how his dog and his car were acting up again and that Mr. What's-His-Name was sweating bullets over losing his job. I distinctly remember telling Greg. Greg was his name. I just remembered that when I wrote this. I distinctly remember telling Greg, I hope he does lose his job. Because of him, I'm in, my, in the hospital and I can't move my arm or leg. And I might have been friends outside of co-workers, but I had no memory. I mean, Greg was a nice enough guy to this day. I have never remembered how he fit into my life. After he left, I never heard from him again. I called and kept a, a couple of messages after I was out of the hospital, but never heard from him again. The point. Memory. That was what I worked the hardest on while I was in the hospital and the rehabilitation center. To this day, I wonder, and I even fear at times, I worry that I left some people behind in the past. Immediate to short term was the biggest loss. But I found holes all through my past. I know that is normal for everyone, but it has become a kind of a personal quest of mine to reconstruct as much as of my past as possible as I can in this lifetime. Also, it is the one loss that I hated most. I mean, you can take or mess up my ability to walk, my ability to hold stuff, my ability to know my arm is on fire. That actually happened once. I, honest to God, started laughing when I uh, when it happened. I, I put it out, but I just started laugh, laughing. Even my ability to smile straight, but my memory, my memory now, that, that was personal. Anyway, while on my quest to remember the past, there were these deep memories. I learned that memories can come in many forms. Sounds, sights, smells, touches, 
and most importantly, the memory of emotion. Not all come with all these elements. As a matter of fact, few will come with all these elements, that much data. Yes, and I was to compute I was into computers back in nineteen eighty seven. I had spent, but I didn't remember till later, two years working on an automation of an answering service in Beverly Hills. The name of which was Beverly it was uh, Telus Limited of Beverly Hills. I had spent two years working them over, switching from cord boards to an automated call distribution system. Uh, the cord board you might remember that um, was in um, uh, uh, Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In and uh, Lily Tomlin played the operator with a cord board. I actually worked on one of those for a while and then I spent two years at the answering service switching all their clients over from cord board operators and cord boards to an asynchronous data and uh, data and phone line call center where they had them come up on a computer system and the number would show up in a box, call would come up, and they'd take in data. It was really neat. Uh, computer monitors displaying caller information synchronized with the caller ID from the call and the line it came in from. I remember it well now. So memories can take up space in your head, like gigabytes of data on your hard drive. Now your brain keeps this data depending on the importance of the event you remember. The more data your head keeps of the event, the stronger the memory. Memories of camping with my father and my family came with tons of data. The sound of his voice, the places we went camping, the smell of toasted marshmallows, the feel of lake water, and the slimy bottoms of rivers. How crisp the air was outside the city, and how happy I felt. These truly were multi-input memories, and I loved them coming back to me. I, I knew that my father and I had become estranged over the years. Honestly, that, that seems to run in my family, estrangement. And I knew that my father and I had shared a lot of life in a short period of time. Until I stumbled across family vacation memories, I'd never known recall like this before. My earliest memories of family vacations came with being hot and the smell of smoke. Campfire smoke, to be exact. And not just during the vacation. Oh, I could remember smelling those campfires for days and even a week after we got home. I still get somewhat nostalgic when I smell a campfire or someone's lighting a wood fire in a, in a fireplace. Regardless of where we were going, how long we would be gone, if we were using our tent, own tent, which mostly we did, or a renter camper, which we did once, it always started the same way. There was first staging. This would start anywhere from one week to nearly a month before the vacation. First thing Dad and I would do would take down the tent. We take down the tent and check the whole thing for rips in the canvas, holes in the screen windows, loose eyelets, ripped or separated seams, holes in the flooring, loose, uh, uh, like I said, eyelets for like the ropes, and just about any damage from the previous year. This would take from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. Usually a Saturday and a Sunday, we'd always have it done. Now, the first step of the staging complete, we move seamlessly to provisioning. My m father never did anything half-assed. Prime example is just how we provisioned for going camping. Today's camping family might think of taking the portable television, their iPads, cell phone chargers, and maybe even a portable DVD player. The years we're talking about are 1963 to 1969, and we took really cool stuff. First, there were medical supplies. My father was an x-ray tech and a med tech and radio operator in the Air Force Reserves. My mother had studied nursing before she'd met my father. So, we took snake bite kits, several sizes of gauze bandaging, tourniquets, triple antibiotic ointments and creams, and lotions, 
anti-inflammatory creams and lotions, Benadryl in many forms, antibacterial wash, which back then was hexaderm. It was a uh, an old hexoglycol-based cleaner, which I don't think they make anymore. Bottles of isopropyl alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, glycerin, and sterilized water, sutures and needles, and one very nice field surgical kit. We took enough medical supplies to care for the whole family getting into a small war. We took bottled waters and sodas and juices. We packed food of all kinds and sizes and fruits and vegetables and potatoes and red deviled potted meats. You remember those? The red devil in the can with a little red devil? Great meats. No, they were actually nasty, but I ate the hell out of them. My father always packed some extra foods, which nobody but he and I knew about. Each time my father would go on weekends with reserves or yearly maneuvers, he would bring home K rations, C rations. Most of them were, well, rations. Nothing one would choose to eat if there was anything else to eat. But one year, uh, he brought back these cereals. They were like grape nuts, and they tasted... Oh my God, this cereal was frigging fantastic. He brought home a, hum a bunch of boxes over two years, but they ran out before we moved to Pearland. If ever I were to find out what that stuff was, and if they still made it, I would eat it every morning for the rest of my life. We took blankets and sheets and padding and sleeping bags. We boxed clothes and shoes and socks and underwear too. We would put all this in the back of a Ford station wagon. Oh, that was my favorite ride. We had the van in the later years, but that Ford station wagon was the one I remember most. It was the first car we took on vacation that had an air conditioner. That was sweet. It was one of those that hung from outside the passenger door window. Um, that was unfortunate that it sat above my mom because my mom had terrible, terrible allergies. The, out, the cold outdoor dare air with all the pollen and the dust and the crud in the air, well, it just made her sick every year. Now, I have no idea how my brother Daryl looks back on these memories. I know that my brother Ken had an admiration for our father, for these arduous journeys. Ken understood that my dad's dad, my, my paternal grandfather Hanning, left my father's family at a very, very young age. My father never went on family vacations and lived in Columbus till the day he left for the Army Air Corps. Ken, my brother Ken, knew our father was just trying to give his something sons something he never had. My father had never seen the Grand Canyon, Carlsbad Cavern, the Painted Desert, or the Four Corners as a child. But he wanted his sons to and to have those memories for life. We did get to see the great American sights for ourselves. And that brings us to the end of part one of the Hanning Van family vacation. Um, we're going to record the, uh, write it actually tomorrow, record it tomorrow evening, and um, I should be posting it hopefully Saturday or Sunday. Again, I'd like to thank everybody for all your support for going along with the ride the story of Daniel is and continuing to talk about the campaign I still need to raise more money um, I'm gonna have to pay people to box things move things put them in a truck take them out um, I'm gonna have to pay deposits but I need to get out of this building and and I need to be able to be in a place that has an elevator and and a way for me to use the power chair and to feel safe using it. So, I'd like to thank everyone for your continued support and continue talking about the campaign. And when I put up a link, share it on Facebook so others can see it, or your connections can see it too. And we've got uh, 76 days left at this point. We're going to keep pushing forward. And uh, thank you. Thank you for everything you've done. And may God bless.